Hello and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm your host, Ian Hartz, and today we can take a little bit of a step back from draft strategy and breaking down the rosters and focus on one of the key elements in football and narrow sport, injuries. And look, I know we talk about injuries a lot in this podcast. Anyone, everyone talks about injuries, but you know, people like myself don't really have any idea what's truly going on with the injuries beyond what the experts tell us. So what I do, everyone, I brought on an expert to help us tackle some of the more relevant f- uh, football injuries in fantasy football land, and that is none other than doctor of physical therapy, medical analyst at Fantasy Points, host of the Injury Prone Podcast, which is a great listen. Evan Porras. Evan, what's going on, man? Not a lot, man. I appreciate you bringing me on. I know you were on my podcast uh, a couple weeks ago. That was a good time. You were spitting straight flames, and uh, I'm ready to go. I'm, try- I'm trying to replicate. I'm trying to reciprocate what you did for me. For sure, man. That was a good time. Always good talking to you. And again, man, this is so, so, so crucial because, again, you know, I hear, you know, a shoulder injury or a knee injury, and obviously that could be one of any of hundreds of things, literally. And we, we end up trying to loop them all together. So everyone check out Edwin on Twitter. If you already don't know him, he's at FB Injury Doc. Guys always got, you know, n- not only just a medical opinion, but usually, you know, years and years of information about uh, the issue at hand to help back up whatever his stance is. So love the work and let's get to it. Edwin, first question. Question, man is Carson Wentz truly injury prone like the haters suggest because you know from my perspective it seems like more of an issue of repeated bad luck than anything uh, yeah I mean you're exactly right you nailed it it's repeated bad luck he's had since since he was at his uh since he was at North Dakota State he fractured his wrist we know that the wrist that doesn't follow him anywhere and we know that it hasn't the research shows that the wrist injuries don't follow players the way that they do other injuries um we know that his acl it takes about 12 to 16 months for that to get better so his acl is better we also know according to the literature that it doesn't affect quarterbacks acl tears don't affect quarterbacks literally financially is what the what the papers say or physically so they're able to perform after that we know that He's ran into this this idea that, you know, quarterbacks shouldn't run. But as, as you mentioned on the Ross Tucker podcast, you gave me a shout out that rushing quarterbacks aren't necessarily more prone to or susceptible to injury than, than non-mobile quarterbacks. Um, there are just so many things like his rib fracture, right? He had a rib fracture at one point. That's well, there's one rib rib fracture per player per team every season in the NFL. And it just happened to be Carson Wentz. Like what are the chances that even happens? His concussion obviously was from a cheap shot. I mean, all of these injuries that you sort of stat, it's not like he's getting one specific, like it's not uh, like a player that we might talk about, like, like James Connor or Will Fuller. Like it's not, that's not the case with Carson Wentz. Like he falls into the unfortunate category of 2.3% of NFL games are uh, don't have an injury literally. And so he just happens to be the one unlucky player who he's fallen in that 2.3% or that, the, I mean, the other 98%, 97% that are getting injuries. So yeah, man, he's, and he's he's on a rocket ship this year. I think that he's gonna he's gonna, he can stay healthy. Um, yeah, I'd be, whatever his. I need to look. I haven't looked at the Vegas total for how many games he'll he'll play. But I'd be willing to hammer the over because the narrative has just gone way too far. Oh yeah, I man. Yeah, I just looked at the uh, Seahawks injury he had in the divisional round, and it's like, yeah, Clowney comes over the top and just spears the dude in the back of the head. You can't blame that on Carson Wentz and write that off as injury prone. And yeah, man. So yeah, your research has shown that you know you don't want. I mean, okay, pocket QBs can obviously win in this league, but, you know, you, you look at injury rates and, yeah, it, it's not like a pocket QB that's never leaving the pocket is any less injury prone. In fact, it seems like someone that can move a little bit, avoid these head-on collisions, maybe a little better because they're a better athlete, and get out of the pocket when they need to and not be, you know, a stationary target. Those are the guys that actually end up being, you know, a little less uh, prone to injuries. Yeah, exactly. You got that right. And I'm looking for that exact – uh, those exact statistics that you're talking about. I know I bookmarked them. People ask me about them all the time. Um, and here they are, right? So you got a, you got a quarterback. Quarterbacks uh, excluding Niels uh, by, by play type, right? So you're looking at essentially scrambles. There's, there are 23 injuries. Or I'm sorry, there are 100, every 107. Jesus, what am I looking at here? <laughs> My bad. All right, so. There is an injury on 1.8% of quarterback knockdowns in the pocket. There's an injury on 1.3% of sacks. There is an injury on 0.9% of scrambles. And on design runs that are not kneels, there's an injury 0.6% of the time. So you're seeing that stepwise decrease every time they take off. Sorry, it took me a while to get going there. I was (laughs) going over and over again. 
All good, man, and uh, good stuff all around. So moving on to another mobile quarterback, and this guy's a little bit more, but Cam Newton. And, you know, I, I do hate when we break down these players and we look at, you know, their uh, potential range of outcomes and, you know, what people land on is just, oh, he'll get hurt, and, you know, without assessing anything else. And I think that's a little bit of what we were seeing with Cam Newton at first when he got the Patriots. You know, some people really thought it was a competition between him and Stidham and Hoyer. You know, I don't have time to talk about all that. But I think uh, more in the narrative was like, okay, like Cam, he's Cam can't stay healthy anymore it has been a while man the shoulder injury in 2018 the foot injury last year looked like a shell of himself when he was trying to play through it understandably I mean those are two worst quarter worst injuries you could probably imagine for quarterbacks so uh, what do you think of Cam Newton's chances to make it through the entire 2020 season you know based on you know him apparently being healthy right now and going through training camp uh, in a good spot I think he can do it, man. I think that he's got a lot of untapped potential this year. So we know that based on all the reports, especially there was a point where they went and scoped his shoulder again, and they just basically put the scope in to see what's going on. He had no damage. It it looked pristine. Uh, This was like two years ago. Uh, Since then, he's had the foot injury. The Liz Frank injury is something that I, I can't say for certain, but I wish that we could sort of rewind the clock. I almost feel like he did more damage by lying to the medical staff about his foot, right? I feel like that was something that maybe he should have held off on um, and and it ended up making it worse. And then they weren't going to do surgery, but then he ended up doing surgery. Like that whole situation was a mess. Now you're looking at a dude who is obviously like dancing out on the practice field, having a good ass time. Like he's, he's doing, he's, he's doing what Cam does. Um, I think that, I don't know if you saw uh, Bill Bell, that picture of him and Bill Belichick, uh, where Bill Belichick's like halfway smiling, like the biggest smile we've ever seen on Bill Belichick's face, right? Like the only, the only, uh, the only person I'd want to look at me like that I think could look at me with more intense passion is Patrick Mahomes last night with the Super Bowl <laughs> ring. Like I think that's the only other person that's happier than Bill Belichick right now. So anyway, moral of the story: I think Cam can stay healthy. I think that the foot is is a a minimal concern. I'm not going to say it's zero concern. Uh, I just, I, and I've said this, I said this on the Ross Tucker pod. I said this to Joe Dolan at fantasy points. Um, basically this is the first time in Cam's life where he's got a coach who's better at his job than Cam is at being a quarterback. So like you pair all those things up with the fact that I think that he's ready to roll. I think that he's as healthy as he's going to be. Um, I'm excited for Cam, man. Man, Belichick was gushing over this dude the other day. I mean, he had a good, you know, 90, 100 second quote on him. And, you know, what we do, I feel like when Belichick just kind of, you know, scoffs at reporters and gives his one word answers, like that's usually what ends up finding its way, you know, onto the ESPN uh, air, uh, wavelengths and all that. But, you know, he'll sit back sometimes and give you like truly a thought out, you know, and uh, just a good answer from, you know, one of the biggest football geniuses the game has ever seen. And just talking about Cam and he just could not stop talking about how hard this guy has been working throughout the whole process now that's always heard about from his time in Carolina even you know going back to Auburn it's just the guy is a grinder hard worker I am rooting so freaking hard for Cam Newton this year one because I'm going to look like a silly fantasy analyst for having him in my you know borderline QB1 ranks this whole time but man <laughs> that's just someone that I, I don't want to bet against because not only you know is he this hard worker who I think we can be confident is doing everything right to get on the field but we just don't have any examples of a healthy even a kind of healthy Cam Newton being on the field and not putting up you know legit top 12 production for the position so cannot wait to see more from Cam Newton in 2020. All right, man, moving on to running backs. Now, you mentioned him before. I've been riding the James Conner hype train a lot this offseason, and I do realize there's injury risk. And, you know, from my perspective, I think that's already really being baked into uh, Conner's ADPs, going almost as like a borderline RB20. I think that's creeped up a little bit, uh, you know, as we've kind of gotten closer to drafts. But he's just the cheapest feature back available. And even if that's come with the risk, I think that's already baked in enough into his ADP to feel uh, okay about it. Because, I mean, if we could turn injuries off in real life like we can in Madden, I think Connor would be anyone's idea of a top five day back. <laughs> I mean, Evan, am I going to have to rely on, you know, half a season from James Connor, Or do you think there's a chance that, you know, he can actually handle these 300-plus touches and, you know, live to tell the story? It's tough to say, man. Like, first, where are you getting your ADP? Because I'm looking at this fantasy football calculator that I put in my, uh, in my profile for him. The last time I checked, he's at 
he's at the 212 in PPR. But I don't know where that source is, is necessarily getting their information from. Um, but he's been on the rise since July at the very least. So I'd have to, we're probably looking at different. And that data is so like random anyway. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing I'm RB17. I'm one of the uh, higher best ball ones. Fantasy football calculator. It, they, they have good historical stuff. I think sometimes they're a tad off, but okay. Either way. <laughs> either way. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, I, I just, it just depends, right? Like you said, um, if it's best ball, pff, whatever, go for it. Um, the thing about James Conner is, since his rookie season, he's finished 13, 12, and nine games, right? That's going in the wrong direction. And the best predictor for health on in the future is health in the past. And we just haven't seen that, man. You also see, and I walked through this on uh, in that profile that I was telling you about. First of all, he had an MCL tear in 2017 that he needed surgery on. That's not common. Only 5%, less than 5% of players who have an MCL tear end up needing surgery. So like that's a connective tissue injury. Then you look at his 2018 where, uh, injury where he had a high ankle sprain. That's a contact uh, uh, connective tissue injury. The MCL was contact connective tissue. You look at 2019, he had the AC shoulder separation. That's a, that's a contact connective tissue injury. That's a problem, man. When you're a running back in the NFL, you're supposed to take, uh, you're supposed to be able to take contact or, or, or be able to take that contact on without injury. At least um, we haven't seen him be able to do that yet since his, since being a rookie. So when you say like, is there a chance? Like, absolutely. There's a chance. I just think there's so many factors that go into it that include his, his previous cancer diagnosis, potentially um, that, that put him, it just seems like, he hasn't been able to do it yet. So I'm sitting on the fence of like, well, I see that you're super talented when you're on, when you're on the field. Um, but you got to show me first before I really, really invest at, at any type of ADP really. Yeah. And it's interesting because he was actually able to overcome their, you know, just atrocious situation under center last year at Mason Rudolph and Duck Hodges. I mean, the PPR RB nine in weeks one through eight before injury. And I mean, 2018, he was again, a top six back. And even more than that, just truly one of the more talented backs we were seeing. I mean, only Saquon Barkley and Kareem Hunt had more broken tackles than Connor, you know, before week 13, when he eventually had to leave. So, you know, it's, you know, kind of a touchy subject, but it's relevant with him. The whole cancer, you know, him over overcoming cancer, you know, being a survivor and stuff, that is something, you know, in your medical opinion that could almost just hurt his chances relative to someone that just didn't have to go through that. Because I, I just don't know enough about the recovery process to, you know, wonder, okay, is he more prone to just regular uh, nicks and bruises and tears and whatnot than someone that didn't have to go through that? Yeah, so that's really, really, really Really interesting question to bring up, man. And you put in the notes too, you said, is, is James Conner a potential exception to that, to the injury prone thing? Dude, he might be because when you get radiation, when you get chemo, which he had Hodgkin's, uh, either Hodgkin's or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and the treatment for that, basically they just blast your cells and the long-term residual effects of that to be completely like Frank is we know enough to know like, yeah, that's probably not ideal. If we were just blasting our, our body cells, we don't know how that's going to affect genetics. We don't know how that's going to affect the way our body creates connective tissue. I'm not saying like 100% definitively that's the case, but when it comes to the medical research and all that and, and, and the NFL research, I mean, he's literally a, a case of one, you know, running back NFL running back we have um, that's a case study. We don't know how all those treatments affect. So dude, I'm not, the one thing I'm not saying is that when he's on the field, he's absolute dominating force like he is he's 100 100 that he's super talented and good uh good at what he does it's just I, like I, I don't know is basically what i'm saying and that's a long way to say like i don't know man like if you want to risk it like i don't i don't blame you because he is he's super good when he's on the field yeah no and that's 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 all you can say man i would rather you say you don't know for sure than try to say you do know one way or another so good stuff all around man all right Another running back that has been banged up uh, more and more in recent years, David Johnson. And, you know, a lot of people's entire kind of breakdown analysis of David Johnson comes down to the one run he had against the Buccaneers where he, uh, he was borderline jogging. You know, I've said it looked like he had a piano on his back. I mean, it wasn't good. I think we can all agree on that. But you look in the first six weeks of the season, man, and okay, a lot of his production was coming from just getting, you know, a bunch of targets, but the dude was making Bobby Wagner miss in the open field. I mean, he maybe he didn't look like 2016 David Johnson, but he certainly looked like a guy that could, you know, get 250, 300 touches and give you, you know, RB2 value with it. So I guess my question is, you know, we had the back and ankle injuries which pretty much tanked his uh, season last year by all accounts in Houston he's been fine I mean do you think there'll be any lingering concerns with David Johnson who I believe uh, just turned 28 you know going into his next stage of his career with the Texans so this one's a tough one for me because 
you you do have to consider at the very least the ankle and the back. I just I wonder how much that actually followed him through the entire season. And when I look at a dude who like when you zoom out, man, like you're not wrong. Like he's you know, when he was RB RB one overall, like he was incredible. But when you zoom out, like he wasn't that good in 2018 either. I know that the situation wasn't fantastic, but I wonder, and I'm I'm circling back to like the my expertise here. I wonder if we just started seeing him decline. Cause we know that by works works by like Adam Harstad. He talks a lot about how even though running backs do last longer in the league than we thought they did initially, and they don't last that much, you know, the time between a wide receiver career and a running back career, there really isn't that big of a gap like we thought there was. But when running backs fall off, man, they fall off hard. And when they fall off hard, we don't see them again. Um, When I look at a dude, like you say, he did just turn 28. At the same time, you have a big study from 2004 to 2014 that basically showed – any player between the ages of 22 and 28, they had to be that in those age ranges to be able to even see 150 carries. After that, they basically coaches just wrote them off or they did fall off athletically. So like, obviously you're in a situation where uh, Bill (laughs) O'Brien traded him. Every time I think about it, I laugh, but he traded for him. So like, he's obviously in a situation now where he's going to feed him. Uh, He's going to give him uh, touches. I just wonder if at this point, relative to his peers, right? Relative to dudes like Jonathan Taylor, CEH, even players like Zeke, Derrick Henry. I just wonder if from that perspective, David Johnson's lost a step because at this point, that's when you start to see my like minute small drops in muscle mass in speed um, in neural connections from your brain to your muscles. And I know that people are like, well, you look at David Johnson, he looks jacked. Like, yeah, compared to the regular human, he's going to look jacked and like he's <laughs> ready to roll. But like, you have to think like at the top, at the top level, at the most elite athletes, they have to have as much uh, athletic reserve and like no drop off and half of a step at all. Because if you lose half a step in the NFL, I mean, shoot, that's the difference between hitting a hole and running off for 20 yards or getting tackled behind the line of scrimmage. So Anyway, all that's a long way to say is like, I'm worried that just from an athletic perspective, David Johnson is no longer where he was um, a few years ago by a bigger amount than any other running back that's 28 years old. And this is, you know, seeing a aging running back start to not resemble the same guys, you know, hardly a unique circumstance for David Johnson. I did an article just looking at, you know, what uh, kind of how many years of experience are most guys having when they you know record their top 12 or top 24 uh, PPR season at each position and running back sure enough you know you see the top years and productivity wise are you know second third and fourth season all usually on that rookie contract and you see that wide receiver as well but the difference is wide receiver we still see almost the same amount of guys balling out in fifth sixth even seventh years to an extent running backs we start to see that drop off do you think over the long term that we'd be better off just more or less fading these running backs, you know, moving teams or going on to their second contracts in favor of, you know, the Jonathan Taylors of the world, like you mentioned, who, you know, at a minimum, even if the, you know, volume might not be as clear to start off, we can at least be a lot more sure about, you know, their high end athleticism and ability to uh, handle a featured load if it comes. Yeah, I, th- I think that it, it, from a dynasty perspective, especially, I think that's like, probably the optimal decision i mean obviously every team's different every roster construction is different everybody's risk tolerance different is different and i think one thing ian that i should that i should mention is i don't necessarily think that like david johnson is toast forever like we're never we're not going to see him produce this year i just think that from what i've seen it's not necessarily coming from you but from what i've seen sort of general consensus is like i heard somebody say that david johnson has top 10 potential dude last year the oldest top 10 back um, I was like 26, 25, 26 years old. And I know I talk a lot about age, but like age does matter when it comes to these types of athletic activities um, at an elite level. And to say David Johnson is going to be an RB1 is like, for me, I'd be willing to bet against that. But like, can he contribute? Like, is he a dude you can get and you can throw him in your flex, um, especially in like these four flex leagues? Like, yeah, I think he can contribute. Absolutely. But I, I, what I'm saying is I think that we've seen peak david johnson and i think that he is on his way out unfortunately from an athletic perspective i've been treating him i think like we should have and i, I don't know I, i've i've treated him and leonard Fournette like the same throughout the offseason obviously that's changed in the last few days but to me like no do not use a top three round pick on the guy 
if everyone's afraid of it and, you know, he falls, you know, into the mid RB 20 range, he's there in round five or six. Okay. Then that's understandable. But yes, I'm with you, man. Do not draft this guy expecting top 10 RB production. In did you, uh, did you see Leonard Fournette uh, got, got waived? Did you see that? Oh yes, I did. I did pick up on that, man. I have, uh, I've not been <laughs> sleeping the entirety of the last two days. <laughs> Just a little bit getting in there, but all right, man. So the big thing with injuries, uh, I, I've kind of come around a little bit this year and, I'm willing to, you know, write off someone like a James Connors injury past uh, in general, assuming they're healthy right now. And I mean, I think that's the trap I, I kind of missed with the AJ Green boat last year where, you know, it's, we just can't always assume that guys are going to get healthy and be 100%. You know, after I heard I have very little Debo Samuel this year because of that, for better or for worse. I just think when guys are getting banged up going into the season, it's, it's a lot riskier. And, you know, the latest guy we've seen that happen with is Jalen Rieger dealing with a shoulder injury, expecting to miss up to four weeks. I mean, uh, I think from what I've seen, this is the same issue that just put Tyrell Williams on the IR for the entire season. Could you uh, speak a little more about uh, Rager's injury and what your kind of expectations are for him once he comes back and if, he, if he'll be able to play at the, you know, the highest level he's capable of? Yeah, man, you're, you're exactly right. Is, is the, what I like to say is like these injuries – increase the range of outcomes they drop the ceiling on these players even if they're uh, or I'm sorry they drop the floor even if their ceiling's still high and yes Rigor's injury is not let me let me say it this way when you see reports that like he's got a a a small labrum tear it's kind of irrelevant the size I mean to a certain extent at least for our purposes like he had a labrum what, what probably happened is he subluxed or dislocated the shoulder right because that was it was traumatic probably what happened i think i think i read somewhere that he dove for a tackle on an interception or something um he damaged the labrum the labrum is the shelf that prevents the ball and socket joint from coming apart and once you do that I mean, there's really no going back um it happens over and over and over again uh, it's it's the same issue that dalvin cook has faced since he was in high school it's the same issue tyro just put tyro williams on the ir uh, it's the same issue that anthony miller's facing he's he's had two or three dislocations and two surgeries in the last couple of years like unless he has surgery relatively soon um this is this is a risk man i mean there's a 40 to 55 percent chance that he he re-dislocates this again and he's out for a lot longer so um it's it's a touchy subject because he's so good and so talented but that is within his range of outcomes now is like he comes back week one makes or i guess week two or three uh, makes this badass catch lands in the end zone and then boom he's out again like then they're really going to have a decision on their hands is like you're a rookie should we shut you down what are we going to do so again like talking about range of outcomes his range of outcomes are, uh, have 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 grown immensely since since i guess the beginning of training camp yeah it's such a shame man i mean to hear what the things he was doing in training camp I and mean, we, we all knew that his college production would have been better at the tcu QB situation had improved, but, you know, going into this year, I think Henry Ruggs was the only other rookie that, you know, had a clear path to the top of the team's depth chart. Might end up being more of a, you know, let's see him prove it out there, prove he's healthy before taking too much of a fancy risk on him. All right, another wide receiver that is, you know, a little bit banged up, but, hey, he's practicing, seemingly healthy to enter week one. That's Jarvis Landry. Uh, you know, a guy that just kind of year after year, man, like the ADP is high and he smashes it and we get back the next year. And the ADP is once again, you know, in the 20, 30 range when we should all be expecting a guy to finish top 15, top 20. So how concerned are you about this hip injury? And do you buy that he can't, could enter week one near 100%? Because I mean, I, I think it was March or whatever. And Jarvis was pretty much saying like, yeah, I'm going to get surgery. It's probably a six month recovery time. We'll see what happens. <laughs> I was nervous when he, uh, when he took as long as he did to get that surgery. But it's one of those surgeries. It's the hip labrum now, not the shoulder labrum. He, he had that surgery. And the cool thing about it is that there's a study showing that for that specific injury, that it's not really, after they come back, it doesn't reduce their, their athletic performance. And yeah, man, you're right. His ADP is always just like super low. I really don't get it. But when it comes to the injury and, and, the, and the surgery that he had, Fixing that labrum has, has never been an issue for him. Uh, it, it, he got, came off the pup. Uh, he followed the exact uh, return to sport time frame that you'd expect. And like I said, there's specifically no drop off in athletic performance or, or, or NFL production. So I think people that are scared off by him, I think you should, you should definitely poach him uh, wherever you can get him because I think that he's going to be just as effective as he, as he could have been last year.
Interesting, man. Yeah, dude, it is really absurd. 2019, his ADP was wide receiver 28, finishes wide receiver 12. 2018, it was ADP wide receiver 17, finishes wide receiver 18. 2017, ADP wide receiver 29, finishes wide receiver 5. And he had another big jump too, man. It's just Jarvis Landry, you know, I, I think uh, he's one of those types of players, just the the kind of high-volume slot receiver that isn't taking the top off the defense that, you know, I just tend to probably not roster and pick as high as I should. Tyler Boyd is another guy like that. Um, I guess, would, are you more concerned about Land? It sounds like you're not very concerned about Landry and uh, his ability to be at a high level in week one. Would you say that, you know, there's a better chance that Beckham could, uh, you know, have some lingering effects from his sports hernia issue? No, man. Uh, both of these guys, it's weird because they both were so banged up in 2019. And then you, they come out, have this surgery. They both happen to have had a surgery that's so successful in their outcomes. Like not every uh, orthopedic surgery is successful. Uh, in fact, some of them can actually make things worse. But when it comes to Odell, it's, uh, I talked about this. I've talked about this uh, at several different places. Like the surgery that he had is super successful. There's a study that came out in Gosh, I think it was 2018, Dr. I'm going to say, oh, Dr. Robert Jack, that's what it is. So they looked at, uh, let's see how many it was, it's 56 NFL players. They're all over the board in terms of like position and age. And what they found essentially was that the year after this athletic pubalgia is what it's called, it's just a sports arena. Uh, what they found is that the year after that, they didn't have a drop off in any type of production. They didn't have a, tr- a drop off in any type of athletic performance. And they were able to perform uh, basically anything, any type of, of dynamic demand that their body required of them. And that's like, that was in a, in a sample of like linebackers, defensive ends, receivers. So when I see that, it's, it's, uh, it's really encouraging. And there are really, really good results with the surgery. So weirdly two dudes who were super banged up in 2019 shouldn't have the same issues in, in 2020. Awesome. And that's exactly the stuff I wanted to hear from you. Like what surgeries are actually like, okay, this went well and which ones could actually be a future problem. What was that funky word for hernia? You said. <laughs> Athletic pubalgia is, is a general. Pubalgia. All right. I'm uh-huh. going to start using that throughout the season. I'm tired of saying, you know, hernia, like, <laughs> right, like all these regular folk out here. It's, it's simply a yeah, uh, poop. I'll, I'll figure out the pronunciation later. <laughs> oh, man. Athletic right. pubalgia. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> Unreal. All right, let's move on to tight end before I completely tank this. All right, TJ Hawkinson, you were one of the only people I saw bring this up uh, kind of over the last month, so kudos to you on that. But, look, he suffered a pretty brutal ankle injury towards the end of last season that, you know, ended him up on IR. And, you know, we see a lot of people get put on IR, you know, the last kind of four or five weeks, just when teams are out of the playoff hunt. So it's kind of hard to distinguish, you know, what was a serious injury and what wasn't. But and this was an issue where, you know, in May, it was just kind of like, okay, well, he's not really 100% yet. There's talks about a walking boot throughout the offseason. And we just don't didn't really know how close Hawkinson was to 100%. He's been at training camp. Uh, you know, uh, apparently doing all right. But do you think there's a chance that, you know, he's kind of still playing through the pain and not quite at 100%? Yeah, man. And to be completely honest up front, I'm not entirely familiar with the specific procedure that he had because I'm, I haven't seen a lot of it. They're just not, and they're not very common. So he could be facing in 2020 a situation similar to to what Evan Ingram is with hardware still in his foot. Uh, I'll do a, di- a a deeper dive into TJ Hawkinson at some point. I just haven't had time to do that yet, but I do want to know a little bit more about that surgery and that procedure because we know that he was running routes. And I think his somebody I read somewhere that his foot was still sore, that he still was having some issues with it, which is totally normal because I mean, you're coming off a major surgery um, to that ankle and that foot that it, it, it's going to, it's going to take a while for you to be back at, at top athletic performance. What helps him is that he's literally like, one of the most athletic tight ends at the position right now. Um, one of the most athletic dudes we've seen in a long time. Um, so that, that's going to help him. That always helps players coming back because they have so much more reserve available to them. This just could be something that lingers potentially. Ankle and foot surgeries are tricky. And if we, if, if we want to sort of bring it back to, you know, uh, Odell and, and Jarvis, those surgeries they had are, you know, pretty much as, as, as good as they get. Uh, not so much when it comes to foot and ankle surgeries, just because you're bearing weight and pushing, pushing off those feet all the time. So as of now, I can see people being a little tentative on him. But like you were saying earlier about somebody else, like that's pretty much baked into his ADP. I feel like TJ Hawkinson's falling, isn't he? Or is he rising? He's, he's, I, I kind of thought he would be a guy that might 
break the top 10 when the beginning of the offseason started. But no, he's kind of chilling at that uh, tight end 15, you know, 14 range. So I, I think that's actually a pretty fair spot for him with the injury concern. I mean, I wouldn't be drafting Hawkinson as, you know, your only tight end in a one tight end league or anything, but definitely seems like, you know, more than worthy of, you know, a dart throwing him and, of course, Chris Herndon, you know, in that back half of the draft, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right, another tight end that is going about that range, eh, a little bit higher. So this one is actually top 10 tight end. Mr. Rob Gronkowski, the GOAT at the position, everyone's favorite, uh, you know, just goofy tight end out there. And Gronk, man, wasn't pretty last time we saw him, man. <laughs> wasn't, you know, brutal. It just wasn't the, you know, world beater tight end we had grown used to seeing. Gronk still, you know, was taking Eric Berry to school in that AFC uh, championship game. You know, had a really big catch on the, I think the only drive the Patriots score a Super Bowl. Uh, score a touchdown in the Super Bowl. God, that game was awful. But um, yeah, so Gronk bad. took a year off. You know, won won a wrestling belt. Was doing all sorts of things. Got Belichick <laughs> come to a Super Super Bowl party. Epic twenty nineteen for Gronk, but he's back on the field with TB twelve in Tampa Bay. I mean, do you think that year off could actually bring Gronk closer to the twenty seventeen uh, form than what we saw from him last? That's tough to say, man. Like initially I want to say yes, but a lot of the issues that he has at 31 years old, I mean, they're just issues that are going to be there regardless if he would have taken the year off or not. And I know that I saw a, I saw somebody tweeted out a video of, of OJ Howard and Gronk running a, just a, like a, like a stop route together, like a, a curl route. And see, they tweeted that uh, Rob Gronkowski looks like your high school coach who said, let me show you how it's done right before they go out and try to run a route. And like, that's sort of what he looked like. Like, I know that they weren't going full force. I know they were going against air, but that's, I think I just, that's who he's got to be, man. At this point, let me give you a full list of all his injuries since, since 2009, herniated disc. Um, let me just read that one. Right. So herniated disc, all the back related ones, um, vertebral fracture and herniated disc. So 2009, 2013, uh, 2016 herniated disc. And it's just something that's not – that herniated disc stuff is not going to go away, man. That's what we're worried about with Camara right now because of the epidural or what and whatnot. So those are the things that, like, are nerve issues that, you, that make you really nervous, not to mention that he's already had groin strain, high ankle sprain, uh, two forearm fractures. He's got one concussion, two concussions that are documented – um, he had a thigh contusion in 2017, and that's the same issue that he had when they won the Super Bowl in 2018 that he talks about. Uh, when it comes to his knee, he's had the ACL tear, and then he ha he needed to have cortisone injection. He's just Gosh. man, his body <laughs> his his body has been absolutely dominated by these injuries, unfortunately. And like once you reach reach a certain point, um, it's hard to be optimistic, especially when you're 31 years old. Um, but I have this chart laid out uh, of Rob Gronkowski, who basically. He's 53% since, since, his, since the beginning of his career, 53% of his games he's played without an injury designation. 26% um, he's missed because of an injury. 19% he's played through an injury designation. So almost half of his career has been in, has involved some sort of injury. And from in a long-term perspective, that really, really does start to affect your joints. It starts to affect the way you move and the way that, that you can move without pain. So uh, basically I'm saying all that to say, can he be like 2017 peak form? I don't think so. Um, but can he be really good in a limited amount of work? I, I still think that he can pull that off. And that's the thing, man. I, and, you know, look, all those past injuries applied to him in 2018. He had less, less rest and, and, again, still made some very big plays and very big games, averaged 9.5 yards per target on the season. I mean, again, it wasn't the, you know, just ho future Hall of Famer Gronk we had grown used to seeing, but still anyone's idea of a very good tight end. I think maybe – I personally am a little lower on OJ Howard than I should be. Cause I mean, you're right, man. He looks great. And I mean, look, we're talking about the top two tight ends and yards per target over the past three years, like a minimum hundred targets. So they've both been efficient as hell. And I, you know, there's, I think we see a bunch of two tight end sets in Tampa, but it wouldn't shock me if Gronk just ends up being a little more of a, you know, block first guy and, you know, really use more in the red zone while OJ Howard could, you know, finally be that, you know, number three receiver that a lot of people like myself thought he was going to be last year. At a minimum, I don't really mind taking a shot on either guy because they are cheap enough. And I mean, in a lot of drafts, that tight end 10 isn't even going until, you know, round round 11 or 12 as it is. So I don't mind taking a shot on him down there. But yeah, definitely wouldn't expect a return to a 2015 form or anything like that. 
All right, man. Those are our top eight players. Thank you for all those notes. That was great stuff. I just want to do a more quick hitting round. You know, give me your thoughts on these guys. Two, three sentences, and uh, we'll get out of here. So first, Tua in Miami. Um, you know, we, ha- we just had a, a, a we just had Coach Brian Flores come out, mention that you know that hip injury is going to play a factor in who he decides is going to start Week One. He's been practicing, but how healthy is Tua right now? <sighs> Here's the thing is that he's healthy and he's cool to do athletic activities. He's cool to play non like play with non-contact jersey on and all that. Um, he's been cleared for that stuff. The problem is you look at the fact that he didn't, this injury didn't happen until November. So he's still about 10 months out and believe it or not, man, like bone density, which is a problem when you have a fracture, like he did and a dislocation bone density takes more than it, like a year, more than a year, 60, 17 18 months to really get back to the point where it was and the reason that bone density is important is it because it prevents further fractures right um, a lot of times bones can heal um, and 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 they you can feel better you can move better you don't have pain but like in the long term it just takes a while for that bone density to get to get back to where it was so when it comes to whether they play to or don't play to a it really has less to do with is he ready yet which he still could be you know at an 85, 90%. That's totally a possibility. He could still be like 85, 90%. Um, but when I look at that, I view it as like a risk mitigation. They really want to give that hip and that joint capsule and those bones as much time as possible uh, to really, really heal up. That way you reduce the risk for it to happen again as much as you, as much as you can. So that's, that's how I view Tua. Sorry, that was way more than two or three seconds. <laughs> oh, you're good, man. It's, you know, it's usually I'm asking people to kind of give like their fancy take on in two or three sentences. So when you got to go through their medical history, it's, I understand <laughs> it's, a, it's a little more important to be thorough. So you are good, brother. All right. Uh, good stuff there. Miles Sanders. Now everyone's, you know, kind of top 10 RB fantasy darling, hoping for 2020. He's been missing time and it's seemingly a hamstring. These teams don't have to report their injuries all that thoroughly until week one. So a little bit of an unknown with Sanders. The coaches have been saying he, he'll probably be good to go by week one. It does seem like, you know, he's not going to miss any game action, but, you know, concern over how close he'll be to 100%. Do you have any thoughts on this injury he's dealing with right now? Yeah, so I have, I've heard that it's a hamstring. That's pretty run-of-the-mill injury. Um, you see hamstring issues being an issue for veterans who are coming off, especially now that we're in quarantine. I mean, you see Golden Tate, Miles Sanders, um, God, there are a few others that have had uh, AJ Green even. But you, you see all these players with injuries. I, I think it'll be a non-issue. Okay, good. I'm happy to hear that. And how about for uh, Kenyon Drake, who, you know, he was rocking the walking boot. He came out on his own Twitter and was like, it's fine, everyone. I was wearing the walking boot last year too. I mean, that doesn't really make me feel all that much better, but he's not worried about it. Kingsbury seemingly isn't worried about it. Are you worried about it? No, that's a quick one. I can do that way. (laughs) (laughs) Fantastic, man. All right, AJ Green. We got an aging wide receiver. (sighs) You know, last year, it's just tough to tell – how hurt was he? How much of it had to do with the contract? Now, you know, comes out apparently motivated. And like you said, hamstring issue. Do you think A.J. Green is going to be anything resembling the world beater we were seeing a couple years ago? No, he's not going to come out and be the world beater that we've seen. Uh, here are a list of receivers older than A.J. Green. Emmanuel Sanders, Larry Fitzgerald, Ted Ginn Jr., Danny Amendola, Julian Edelman. Those are the five oh. receivers who are older than than AJ Green. He's already had this history of hamstring issues and connective tissue injuries. This is unfortunately, this is just who AJ Green is. I know he's got a lot of name brand appeal. This is just, this is AJ Green. This, the, he's on the sideline with a hamstring injury. This is him, unfortunately. I really wanted to believe, but as I was kind of making a big rankings adjustment before last weekend when everyone's having their drafts, I did find myself bumping AJ Green down a lot. I, I just don't want to take that risk. You know, well, give me, you know, your DK Metcalfs and there's these studs that are healthy and have their best years ahead of them still at this point. Uh, T.Y. Hilton, another guy where, you know, man, he only missed one game from 2012, 2017. And unfortunately he's missed eight over the last two years was already apparently, you know, dealing with another hammy issue in July. I think he's been out there you're doing his thing a little bit, but clearly he's already not at hundred uh, percent. What do you think about Hilton going to 2020? Yeah, I put Hilton in my red light tier at fantasypoints.com in my tiers, physical volatility tiers. Uh, I didn't expect him to like be in this position in the middle of July already, but he is a dude who's I think 30. Um, once you get to that point, you really start to see the decline athletically like we talked about already. I think he's a guy that can still contribute in a way similar to David Johnson. I just wouldn't expect like 
world beating top 10 potential from T Y Hilton necessarily, especially from when it comes to like a raw accumulation of points. Cause I think he's going to, he, he has an, the potential to miss a couple of games. Yeah. It's going to be more important than ever for Hilton to, you know, really have that athleticism too. I think we're going to see way more of a dink and dunk approach with, uh, you know, Phillip Rivers under center now in Indy. All right. Debo Samuel saw a video of him, you know, in reports that he's running pretty fast, running pretty well. But, you know, this Liz Frank injury, you said it, man, before, like these ankle and foot injuries, it, it makes sense when the guys are more sore and, you know, we should be paying attention to those. Personally, man, I don't know if I've even gotten Debo in a single draft uh, since this injury came down. Do you think that he's had enough time to recover and resume kind of being the guy we saw in 2019? Or is this an issue that you think fantasy investors should be extremely wary, wary of? Uh, So it depends, I think, because somebody tweeted at me uh, earlier this week and was like, yeah, I just got Debo Samuel on the 15th. I'm like, oh, all right. Yeah, man. Take it. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) exactly. So if that happens, I mean, yeah, I mean, go for all systems go. Um, There's about a 10% refracture rate. It seems like his his rehab's coming along nicely. It seems like he's going to be right on that 10 to 12 week timeline that we talked that I talked about back in June. So uh, as long as you know that you there is a little bit of risk there, more so than there was before the injury happened, obviously. Um, but I, I think that he's a dude that can come out and perform. I think he's a dude that can still show out. Um, and God, man, that that wide receiver room is just so banged up right now. Like at some point, it, it does come down to volume to a certain extent. Yeah. Yeah, the 49ers and Jets are just so banged up right now, wide receiver. Hopefully those guys can't get healthier. All right, really smart thing I thought you said earlier was that, you know, the best predictor for future injuries is what happened in the past. And, you know, referencing James Conner, you know, missing more and more games by season. Another guy that applies to is Evan Ingram, 15 games in 2017, 11 in 2018, eight in 2019. He's a top five tight end in real life and fantasy anytime he's on the field. You know, good reports coming into 2020, but how confident are you that Ingram can, you know, put together even, you know, a 13-ish game season? Confident-ish? <laughs> uh, you didn't I say that, that very confident ish <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing, man, is I think that Ingram can play, you know, 13, 14 games um, outside of the concussions. You got to be careful with the concussions. When it comes to his foot, which is what I'm the most concerned about, um, I think his it, it's the, the problem with him is going to be consistency. Uh, I think that uh, just from an athletic perspective, I think we're going to have Sundays where he's looking good. He's feeling good. And he's looking like he's feeling good. I think that there are other times where he's going to wake up and be like, man, fuck, my foot hurts. You know what I mean? And I think that we're going to see that on the field. I think it's going to be the up and down. Um, it's going to be one of those things that you have to decide on. It's like the mean median type thing. Okay. Okay. Makes sense, man. Well, that's going to do it. Thank you again for coming on, man. I really think uh, you helped put a lot of context around these injuries, you know, knowing that, okay, not every shoulder uh, injury is created equal. And, you know, yeah, just I would tell, tell everyone out there, you know, uh, keep all, these, all this in mind. And, you know, when you're going through your drafts, looking at the value, just, you know, hey, is this guy in the wide receiver three range only because of this injury? Like, those are the guys I'm willing to take a chance on. You know, not so much if, uh, you know, it's someone you're reaching for, you know, in the third round, like, you know, your David Johnson or James Carter. Probably not do that, although I'm still going to the bank with my guy Connor a little bit. (laughs) Do it, man. uh, Do it. You got to. All right, and Evan, you are on Twitter, at FB Injury Doc. You're doing fantastic work at Fantasy Points. Anything else you want to plug, man? Nah, man, just injury prone fantasy football podcast, uh, fantasypoints.com, all my written stuff. I appreciate you having me on, man. It's a good time. Yeah, bro. Always good talking to you. So that's going to do it, everyone. He's Evelyn. I'm Ian. This is the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. Until next time, take care. Thanks for watching the PFF YouTube channel. And if you want to subscribe, all you have to do is push the button. Don't forget everything you get. A little fantasy, push the button. A little green line for the gambling aspects of the game? Push the button. College football? Push the button. The YouTube channel from PFF.